we've got great scripture this morning. And as you can see up there, um, Judas in the scripture, we're going to read that in just a minute. He, he uh, asked a question, why was it this soul? And you know, we talked a little bit last week about Mary and her anointing. What this week does is point out the difference between somebody like Mary who loved Jesus with a sacrificial love and Judas. And what I'm going to try to do is not talk a whole lot about Judas because he wasn't particularly a good guy for all the reasons that we know. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on him. Let me go ahead and I'll go through the slides. What's the next slide? Please, ma'am. Thank you. This week's takeaways. Believers should humbly honor Christ's Lord. That's simply what Mary did. That's where that point comes from. We ought to be doing the same thing, honoring our God. And I would ask you the question this morning, as we're going through the lesson, or I would humbly encourage you, how are you honoring God in your life? And we talk a lot about that. And I know most of y'all are doing that. But I want to encourage you this morning, honor God. And how do you do that sometimes? And they tell us with what they ask us in the third point there. And we'll rush ahead. It says believers honor Christ by testifying to others about his work. God do good things in your lives? I know some of y'all. I know he does. He does good things in your life. We went out to the range and we were shooting yesterday. Hank was out there. He was able to hit the target. I know that's only because Jesus loves him. That he's going to say, I got it, brother. Hit the round. In that part, that uh, middle that believers should affirm others who worship Jesus. You encourage your brothers and your sister. We talk about that a lot. Now, you do. Are you doing it? Somebody sent you in a card. That's encouragement. Y'all ever get a card from somebody? Gary, I told y'all about this. He'll text me sometimes. Hank texts me all the time. Hank, God bless him. He'll send me a text about that line. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a whole sermon he sends me. I need it. Oh, encourage your brother and your sister if you're not doing that at this point. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, if you will, in honor of God, let's uh, please rise for just a moment and we're going to read the scripture. It begins in chapter 12 and it goes uh, verses 1 through 11. And uh, I'm going to pray real quick first. Lord, please let it be that you set our hearts on fire this morning with your mighty word. And we ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Beginning at verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived. Y'all remember Lazarus? He was raised from the dead, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why was it this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself with what was put into it. Mm -hmm. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Next slide, please, man. <clears throat> Y'all ever wondered about nard? I wanted to give you a little bit of trivia this morning. I have always wondered about nard. That's the blossom of nard. Grows, I'm sure you've read your lesson, grows in China, parts of China, parts of India, Nepal, up in the mountains. Not so easy to get to. That's the blossom of it. If you go to the next slide, please, ma'am. On the right is the fruit. That's where they extract the nard from. And on the left is a vial of pure nard. It's roughly the color of olive oil. Again, just a little bit of trivia. It has a viscosity that's very near to uh, water. So it's not thick so much like olive oil. <clears throat> in um, 
whatever year it was, y'all remember that king of Egypt, Tutankhamun? I'm not sure I'm now pronouncing that correctly. They uh, went into his tomb, and guess what they found among other things? They found some spike nard, nard. and it was uh, mm -hmm. had, had a texture and consistency much like a bar of soap. They did a little analysis on it, and it was made with something like goose fat and spark nard, spike nard, so that it would, um, as it cooled, become uh, harder. And they said that when they uh, opened it up, it had the fragrance. Have you ever wondered what it had? <laughs> that fragrance that filled the room? They said it had a fragrance that was similar to coconut oil. And if you read about spike nard today, essentially that's what you'll hear people say that, or, or that's what you'll read that it's uh, smelled like coconut oil to some degree. Next slide, please. Now, the whole conversation about spike nard is kind of interesting. It was grown, as they said, over in China and uh, Nepal, which is over here somewhere, and then uh, Northern India, which is here. You've got the Himalayas and um, difficult, some kind of sort of to get that stuff from here over to uh, Jerusalem or any part west. The distance from Jerusalem was 3,000 miles. So you can imagine that stuff was very expensive. In today's money, that nard that she used on Jesus' feet in today's money would be like fifty-three thousand dollars. Wow, that's pretty significant. Of course, it's a year's wages, and so you can see that was a sacrificial gift. Y'all ever give a gift like that? You probably give your children gifts like that every year, <laughs> or you think about it. Anyway. This is something I might think I would do. Yeah. It was a significant gift, and I wanted to point this up to you. Here's the, the thing, though. It's not that it was so far away. It was the difficulty of getting it from over here in the Himalayas to Jerusalem. You went over several mountain ranges. One of them was the Hindu Kush. Any of y'all ever been in the Hindu Kush? I've had the opportunity to be in the Hindu Kush. I will tell you that that is one place on this earth that you can just forget about ever wanting to go there. You don't want to go there. <laughs> Not a happy place. Some people might call it the armpit of the world. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but not, not much. The Himalayas, I don't know if y'all ever been there before. I've never been to the Himalayas, but I will tell you that it's not so uh, not so happy place to come through working your way to Jerusalem. And then if you look at the deserts, there are at least three deserts that they go through. They uh, may have gone through southern Afghanistan, and there's a place down there called Helmand Kandahar. It goes so hot down there that um, it's up in the range of around 150 degrees. Just a wind blowing through there. If you go through that desert, you sometimes will come across uh, derelict vehicles. People decided they were going to go across the desert here. And it'll have mummified remains of people in there because they weren't prepared for the long distances. They didn't have water. It was so hot. The wind was blowing so hard, kind of like a sandblaster. And just absolutely wouldn't, if you stood still long enough, would mummify you if you weren't prepared for the trip. I'm not making this up. <laughs> that actually happens today. That kind of stuff still happens. So the trip from out here with that stuff over to Jerusalem was a significant trip. That's why it was so, so expensive. Now, you today, if you wanted to buy some spike nard, you can do it. A bunch of it comes from Jerusalem. They make it over there. It's kind of a cottage industry. You can get 12 ounces for about $264. That's pretty inexpensive compared to what it was back then. Anyway, y'all got enough information about spike knives? Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. Do they just use it as a perfume? Or it's an anointing oil, usually, what you find. Uh, that kind of thing. They sell it to tourists. You know, when y'all go over there in May, they will try to sell you some spike art. Won't you bring some back there? That would be cool. So next time this lesson comes up, you go up to scripture, you can show people the spike art. I was going to order some, but I couldn't get it fast enough. Anyway, next slide. Now, we're going to spend most of our time. Yeah. I'm just curious. How do you think Mary, who Jesus delivered, came upon that? Somebody used, did something that cost them. Yeah. Well, think about where they lived in Bethany, only two miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on the Silk Road, at the end of the Silk Road in the Middle East. 
and um, it was a large that money was? It was a metropolitan area. Well, they had a tomb. So as a family, the indicators are that they were not destitute, that they had maybe a better situation than many people have. Um, probably, I don't know, just speculation, who knows? This was her personal money. Might've been money she'd been saving her entire life. Holy Spirit moved her to do what she did. No question about it. She did an incredible thing. We'll talk more about it. I don't want to get too on that right now. I was coming across, there is artwork that dates back centuries of what Mary did for the Lord Jesus. You remember that Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached, this will be told of what she did for him, uh, wherever the gospel is preached as a memorial to her. So there is artwork dating centuries of Mary. This was one of the most beautiful that I found. And if you don't mind, just leave that up. And if you can see it, the expression on her face is nothing but pure love. And you describe what she does in a scripture. And uh, I'm, I don't even have words. You know, I don't. If you consider your, just a moment, try to put yourself in that place. We are having this dinner. And um, here this woman is. She loves the Lord so much. She takes something like maybe her life savings and invest that in perfume and anoints his body. That's just an incredible thing. And you can't say enough about it. So anyway, going on, we're going to try to draw a contrast between Mary, the love that she had, and Lazarus. Significant difference between the two. Scripture begins six days before the Passover. The time has come. Now, you recall in Scripture how many times Jesus said, my time has not come. You remember it in uh, John 1. Uh, he's at the wedding in Cana, and he tells his mother Mary when she asked him to do something about her running out of wine. He tells her, my time has not come. Over and over in the Gospels, Jesus said, my time has not come. I told y'all that at least eight times the authorities tried to seize Jesus because of something he said. It was usually behind one of his I am statements, I am God. And his time has not come. They couldn't lay a finger on it. When he was in his hometown of Nazareth, and he went into the synagogue at the beginning of his ministry, and he read from Isaiah. And he told him, this prophecy has come true in your presence today, paraphrase. And they wanted to throw him off the hill, stone him at that time. But his time has not come. None can touch the Lord before his time. None, as I've said it before, and I'm going to say it to you again, because it's important that we all get this, can touch you before your time. And y'all may want to dispute with me about that. And I'm happy to show you the scripture after class. Y'all come to me if you don't believe it. But I will prove to you that your days are numbered according to God's plan for your life. Mm -hmm. And you should bank on that. You're going nowhere before it's your time. When it's your time, as we said, you better be ready. Lord, that's what I'm talking about. Now, scripture says, for this reason, the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. The Lord knows time is near. He says, no one takes it from me, my life, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Discharge I have received from my father. Ecclesiastes 3 says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heavens. Habakkuk 2, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. In your life, sometimes you think, ah, what's God waiting on? Be patient. Psalm 27, wait for the Lord. <laughs> Scripture said, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Don't be willy-need Christian like Michael Holland used to say. Y'all remember him saying that? He said it quite often. Do not be, must have been a point to that, a willy-need Christian. Be strong. What did God say to Joshua over and over? He said, be strong and courageous. Was he with Joshua? Every step of the way, they conquered giants. You got giants in your life? Some of y'all do. Be strong in the world. Be courageous and stand. Don't be moved because your God is with you. If you don't want to hear anything else this morning, your God is with you, and there's nothing that comes at you 
that's not been at at, at, at a minimum, the permissive will of God, and he's going to take you, protect you, keep you, cover you over with his wings, deliver you from or through. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Second Peter 3, knowing this first of all. Now, this is happening in our day and time. That scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. I don't know if we're in the last days. I kind of think we are, but that's my opinion. I don't know. What I do know is that there are scoffers out there and there are people who say, ah, that Jesus, you've been talking about him for over 2,000 years. Where is he? When's he coming? Well, you just stand by and wait. Yeah. Scoffing following their own simple desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. That's what they said, if you remember, during Noah's time. They were marrying and giving in marriage and their destruction is about to come they didn't have a clue they should have god had given plenty of warning you and i should be prepared because the time is coming and i'm not trying to cause you concern this morning i'm just telling you what you should know what you do know excuse me the lord is coming back he said it would come yeah. every prophecy about the lord jesus christ was fulfilled it's true we're waiting on the second coming you think that one's true too? Oh, yeah. John 16, 33. Mm -hmm. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Just what we're talking about. I have overcome the world. Now, the significance of the Passover. He came about a week before the Passover. Remember, as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, that the Lord established Passover. Why did he do it? Go ahead. Time for y'all to talk. Pass over. Protection. Show their faith. Say again. A show of their faith. Yes. Yes. Blood on Anything else? Mike, go ahead. It was one of seven appointed times between Israel and Yahweh throughout the calendar year. And it was designed to prepare them for the coming of the silence. Mm -hmm. The first four point to the First coming and the final three point to the second. Did God have a plan, Mike? Yes, he did. And this is part of that plan, isn't it? Yeah. This whole business didn't just happen, did it? There was no coincidence. If you're a Christian today, there is no coincidence. God has had a plan from the beginning called the covenant of redemption. Some people believe that, some people don't believe that. I happen to believe it. Scripture tells us about it. A lamb's blood was placed at the door's edge, telling the angel to death to pass over this home. That was when the Passover began. Blood is required. Now, I've got a point to all this. Y'all hang with me. Hebrews 9. <clears throat> indeed, excuse me. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you, it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. For men, remember John the Baptist's words. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Y'all remember what day Jesus was crucified on? That's right. It was a Friday before the Sabbath. You remember they wanted to take him down before the Sabbath. But what else was that day? It was Passover. God's perfect timing. Nobody took his life from him. He laid it down. Part of the recovery, well, the covenant of redemption, God's plan from the beginning. It is not um, that coincidence Jesus happened to be crucified on Passover. He was the Lamb of God for you and I. This Easter season is such a wonderful season here. I love Easter as much as I love Christmas, as much as I love Thanksgiving. Easter, probably more because of the resurrection, what it means. How wonderful. Our God made a way for us. That's what we get out of this scripture this morning. Our God made a way for us. Hebrews um, 10. You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings. And it goes on down to verse 10. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. His righteousness was imputed to you and me on the cross at that Passover crucifixion. And our sin was in. Come on in, Rick. Our, that's Rick Parker, y'all. 
He ain't late. He's right on time. <laughs> and our sin was imputed to Jesus Christ. That Passover was a wonderful, wonderful day. It was horrendous. And what God had planned for his son. But the blessing to you and I, there is just what Mary did. Yeah, it's so appropriate. Such a good thing. There is no coincidence. This is a little ditty. There is no coincidence in God's providence. Y'all should remember that. No coincidences for Christians. Uh -uh. If you belong to God, you're working out a plan in your life. Now, Bethany. Scripture says he went to Bethany. Why did he go to Bethany? Well, it's close to Jerusalem. He's got um, this task of the cross before him. So, of course, he's going to be there. But why did he go to spend time with Lazarus and Simon the leper and Mary and Martha? Because they were his friends. Our Lord loved his friends. Scripture says he did. Our Lord loves. Fellowship is a good thing. You all get together with your friends and fellowship. If you don't, if, who doesn't have friends in here? No, don't raise your hand. That's okay. <laughs> I'm being silly. I shouldn't. We all need friends. Friends are a blessing to us. Listen, he was fixing to go through a travail, a hard time. I can't imagine. His human side, you know he suffered. You know he did. The Garden of Gethsemane tells us he did. But his friends encouraged him and lifted him up. Imagine this minute you're at that supper. Here's Simon the leper. Uh, Matthew and Mark, in our parallel scripture to this, say that the, the dinner was in uh, Simon the leper's house. Well, they call him Simon the leper. But don't you reckon he wasn't a leper anymore? Don't you reckon that Jesus had already healed that man? Of course he had, because you couldn't be hanging out with lepers. So there's Simon the leper. He's been healed. Here's Lazarus. He's been raised from the dead. This is a this is a happy get together. These people are having a good time. Can't you imagine there was laughing going on? Can can you just hear just a little bit if you put your your heart in it? The Lord laughing. There was storytelling going on. What do you do when you get together with your friends? Yeah. And it's friends forever. Um, we did it not too long ago. And we were telling stories and remembering things that happened 50 years ago. And laughing. And belly laughs. That's what was going on. Our Lord loved these people. They loved him. And what wonderful miracles he had worked in their life. And they were belly laughing. And don't you know that was an encouragement to him as he was about to go to the cross? They were eating together. Get together with your friends and eat. There's something special in that. And if you're a Baptist, you can't help yourself. That's what you're going to be doing. He's near the garden. The Lord took encouragement from his relationship to the Father. He spent time in the garden praying. Scripture says throughout that our Lord spent time praying. He was one with the Father, and the Father was one with him. Why well, didn't just happen? He built that, excuse me. He had that relationship and he encouraged that relationship. He worked through prayer to continue to sustain that relationship and on his human side. Our Lord took encouragement from this, from uh, Bethany, from his friends, from the location. Now, <clears throat> here's old Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, there's something interesting about the scripture of the Gospels. The Lord in the Gospels raises three people from the dead. One was um, the little girl uh, who was the daughter of Jairus, uh, the, the leader in uh, the synagogue in Capernaum. And uh, you don't hear about people in that particular instance believing in the Lord Jesus Christ the way they did at Lazarus' resurrection. Circumstances were a little bit different, but I'll come back to that. And then you had uh, <clears throat> the Lord, he raised the widow's son at the little village about eight miles south of Nazareth called Nain. And you read in that scripture where many believed from that area because of Jesus raising uh, that young man from the dead. And of course, with Lazarus, we know there were many Jews there and many believe, not all, as we talked about. Some did, some didn't. But scripture says specifically that many believe. The point I'm making from this with Lazarus is that there were those who believed in the Lord. They, there were those who did not believe. 
You know what the Lord said about Capernaum? Because there was no belief there. The Lord did that great miracle and many more in Capernaum. He lived in Capernaum for a while. That's where his, if you, if you will, his headquarters was for a while. The Lord said that because of Capernaum's unbelief, they're going down to Hades. That's the quote. Going down, excuse me, in today's vernacular, that means they're going to hell. That's what the Lord Jesus said. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. That's what he said. They're going to hell. But it said more about it. The scripture says that it will be more tolerable for Sodom on the last day than it will be for Capernaum. Now, it mentioned several other cities in that region besides Capernaum because they didn't believe in Jesus did many of his miracles there. But he says specifically, the Lord Jesus says specifically, our God says specifically, because of their unbelief, they're going down to hell. And at judgment, <clears throat> Tyre and Sidon and Sodom are going to get a better deal than they're going to get because of their unbelief. Tyre and Sidon, if you look at your history, that was one evil place. That was, they worshiped Baal there. You can't believe the way they worshiped Baal there and a host of other gods. It was a totally godless place. But it's going to be more bearable for them because the Lord said, if the miracles that I had done in that region, Capernaum and roundabout, had been done there, they would have believed. Right. So why spend any time talking about all this? How are you doing this morning with your belief? Do you live your life in such a way that people know that you belong to the Lord? And that's a hard question to answer sometimes. If you catch me sometimes during a week, you guess uh, that Bubba mm. probably with some of y'all, it may be the same way. But here's the big kicker: is the thing that I always ask you. So you believe? What about those you love? What are you doing to help them along? Are you working hard on doing everything you can? For those who you may know and love, who may not believe. We need to be doing that. Now, as always, I'm going to run out of time. Here's the deal. Judas took, Mary gave. She gave lavishly and sacrificially $53,000 in our money. Mary loved. Judas loved taking care of himself. Mary's devotion to the Lord was genuine. Judas betrayed the Lord with a kiss. That to me is absolutely despicable. Betrayal of a friend, betrayal of a Lord that you spent three years with, you've seen everything that he had done, and you betray him with a kiss to the Romans. And they hated the Romans. Not only the Romans, but of course the Jewish leaders, but the Romans were a part of that. He betrayed them to the Romans. I mean, that's like me betraying one of my brothers to the Russians. And to you young folks, that doesn't mean anything, but I, I really I, I hate the Russians. I don't hate them today. I love everybody today. That's what I'm doing. Pray about it. I don't, but I pray, pray that I will. Now, I love the Russians. That's just too far. That's too far. I should be a stand up comedian. <laughs> Mary's gift to the Lord was exalted. What a gift. What are you doing for the Lord? What are you doing for the Lord? I know, I know y'all. I, you know, I can't ask y'all questions like that. That other church over there, I can yes. ask that question like that. But I can't ask y'all because y'all do it. Y'all working. All y'all working all the time. Y but I got to ask it anyway. It's you know, part of the deal. So her love was just immeasurable. All that she had. She gave everything she had. I expect it was her life savings. I don't know that, but I believe it in my heart. She didn't hold anything back. Nothing. Are you holding back from the Lord? Well, don't you do it. Mary's heart was fully, fully God's. She belonged completely to him. She gave herself to the Lord. Judas gave himself to Satan. Ah, oh, how tragic that is. We're so out of time. I'm sorry. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for the day and the blessings of it. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness and your grace. Lord, here they are. Here's your people this morning. You've heard their request. We lift them up to you and those also, Father, that were not spoken. We pray that you'll have mercy and blessings only you can do. Lord, we ask you because you told us to. We ask you because nothing is impossible for you. We ask you, Lord, because we know that you love us. We're the sheep of your pasture. And so 
We depend on you, we hope in you, and we lift our request. Please do what only you could do, Lord Jesus. Now, Father, as they go, please bless them, keep them, let no harm come to them, cover them with your wings. Their families, their extended families, their children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. Please bless them, keep them, bring them back safely next week. Lord, let it be in our hearts like it was in Mary's heart. Let us have a love for you that goes beyond any measure. That we'd be willing to give you the best that we have and all that we have the way that she did. Lord, here you are. We're talking about what you said we would talk about. We're talking about this woman who loved you because you said that we would. We pray that like her, we have that kind of love. Oh, Lord, please hear our prayer. Lord, if anything, this prayer we lift up above all prayers, that we would love you completely with our total being. And it's in Jesus, your mighty name we ask it. Amen.